Welcome to the Race Before Race Roundtable to Protect and to Serve. I'm Ayana Thompson, the director of the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies. As many of you know, Race Before Race is an ongoing conference series and professional network community by and for scholars of color working on issues of race in pre-modern literature, history, and culture. The series is generously supported by strategic initiative funding by the president of Arizona State University, the Humanities Division of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and underwriting by the HITS Foundation. We welcome live tweeting during the event, so please use the hashtag race before race. When I was a graduate student, I had the great good fortune to be admitted into one of the Folger Shakespeare Library's research seminars. I arrived very early the first day of the seminar, and I had to walk around Capitol Hill, uh, the Capitol Hill neighborhood, until the library actually opened. During my walk to waste time, I was stopped by two police officers who questioned why I was walking. Who was I? Did I have proper ID? Why was I walking around? Now, this was pre 9-11, so there was not an enhanced police um, presence on the Capitol. The problem was my identity. So I was relieved when the library opened so that my function in the neighborhood could be justified but my admission process there was no easier. I was questioned by both the guards and the librarians in a similar manner. Who was I? Did I have proper ID? Why did I want to be admitted to the library? Could I prove that I was in a seminar? Somehow I was viewed as a threat by the police and the librarians. Their neighborhood and rare books needed to be protected from me. I did not need to be served. To its credit, the Folger Shakespeare Library has taken numerous steps in the intervening 21 years to be a more inclusive institution, and Michael Whitmore's leadership is truly inspiring. Nonetheless, that experience has impacted the ways I have tried to challenge, diversify, and expand our fields. In the wake of the murder of George, George Floyd, I thought a lot about the motto of the police, to protect and to serve. Because really, it all hinges on how one defines the borders of the community. Who and what is included, and who and what is excluded. This roundtable is an opportunity for us to think individually and collectively about the way our fields protect and serve ideologies, power structures, institutions, and individuals. Our four speakers today, Justin Shaw, Carissa Harris, Cord Whitaker, and Margot Hendricks, will provide five-minute reflections, and then we'll have a dialogue. Since we only have one hour together, I will not read their impressive biographies. They are all available on the ACMRS website. Please submit questions during the talks and we will attempt to address them during the dialogue portion of the event. Don't save them to the end because it's too much at once. So, <laughs> And now it is my pleasure to invite Justin Shaw to speak. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to express my sincerest gratitude to Iona Thompson and the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies for their ongoing support in curating the necessary intellectual collective we call Race Before Race. My little contribution to this discussion is entitled, You Still Have Work to Do, Vignettes of Black Grief. I've been struggling lately. I've been exhausted weary from navigating the structures of whiteness, even now in a world driven to universal dismay by a global health crisis, disoriented in a world where I too can be killed in the street, assaulted in the park, or shot dead in my home while sitting, writing about Shakespeare. It's easy to lament and protest the injustices in and out of the academy and to believe that pre-modern studies is getting better, doing more than most, 
But I must pause while you celebrate yourself and ask, is that true? For whom is that true? Listen to any of us and you might hear a different story. In quarantine, I've asked myself, how, as BIPOC scholars, can we care for ourselves? How can we care for one another as we struggle together, grieve together, and express our rage together in the streets, on social media, and remotely hoping for a better tomorrow? As we move into a new phase of academic and institutional life, I think about those of us who risk deep personal loss while spending an inordinate amount of time trying to make white people, white colleagues, editors, students, administrators feel comfortable. I grieve with those of us who suffer in silence, being the quote only or the quote first of a few in our departments and are reassured with the smile that all scholars matter while bearing a psychological and emotional weight we were never meant to carry alone. I raise up those pre-modern BIPOC scholars who have long invested work in the field and even now are silenced and erased while white progressive scholars who tell me they were proud to vote for Obama sit back and publish those ideas to great acclaim. Where will you be while we self-consciously police our emotions, tone, and attire in the classroom, telling ourselves that we too are scholars phenomenally, but not too much, lest we provoke the ire of racism, ableism, and misogyny expressed so often in student evals. While we may defy all odds to earn the PhD, the job, the book, tenure, we aren't immune to being harassed in the library, profiled and arrested by campus police and routinely confused for hotel staff at our beloved conferences. I fear real heart trouble, given the number of times my own heartbeat has skipped or raced from what you think is the mundane act of passing through the censors at the library, expecting to be publicly humiliated or chained over a $40 book that I must have stolen. I must be a perfectionist, stressing over every dotted I, comma, and crossed, crossed T just to prove that I am worth playing the role of token for a department that believes year after year that there aren't any more qualified Black scholars on the job market who would make a good fit. We are told that the only way to expect change is to work within this slow-moving institutional system. And yet with each new reform comes a new iteration of oppression. In other words, we get invited to sit at a table that's already and irreparably broken. And you don't want us to fix it, only maintain it, which would mean choosing between tending to my own mental health and catering to your passivity. Fixing it, however, would mean tearing it apart from the very fibers. Fixing it would mean deconstructing the very essence of what makes it a table in the first place. Because tables are only diverse, inclusive, and equitable up to a point. Fixing what you broke might just mean moving beyond reform in our fields and toward an abolitionist ethic, i.e. the courage to imagine and create something new. So I have just one question to leave us with, or rather to commence with. After all is said and done, we've overcome the Rona, you've marched in the streets, you've made a hashtag appearing to say her name, you've read your Kendi and D'Angelo, done your diversity workshop, put out that institutional statement. But when you've seen me, and when you've sincerely heard me, and you sit with my grief, what will you do with yours? To put it in another way, after you've moved through your own stages to quote unquote, get woke and accept the fact of your own grief, the question remains, what then? Or rather, what now? Thank you. And Next, we will have uh, Carissa Harris.
All right. So my remarks today are titled Service and Protection, Medieval Knights, the Police, and Sexual Violence. When I started brainstorming my response to today's theme, I immediately thought about medieval knights and the contemporary police because both are charged with protecting individuals from sexual violence, according to their self-proclaimed institutional missions, at the same time that they are not infrequently perpetrators and enablers of sexual violence. Today, I'll look briefly at some resonances between knights and the police, analyzing how to protect and serve operates in theory and in practice regarding sexual violence. I'll close read a couple of medieval literary passages and bring them into conversation with contemporary cases of police sexual misconduct, paying careful attention to how the rhetoric and practice of protection and service functions both then and now. The language of service is central to representations of knighthood in medieval literature. According to the Middle English Dictionary, the verb servant means to serve as a knight or retainer and also to render the service of a professed lover. Knights claim it is their duty to protect ladies from violence. Sure is filled with knights who are also rapists. In Sir Thomas Mallory's Lamorque to Arthur, which is particularly fitting to this discussion because its author was a knight who wrote the text while imprisoned after being accused of raping Joan Smith on two occasions in 1450. The Knights of King Arthur's Round Table take an annual oath to protect women from rape. Every year at Pentecost, they promise to always do ladies, damsels, gentlewomen and widows succor, meaning aid or protection, and never to enforce, meaning rape them upon pain of death. It's important to note that the Knights do not vow to protect all women from rape, but specifically well-born women, ladies, damsels, gentlewomen. But the Mort to Arthur features multiple Knights who do not follow these knightly ethics of protecting women from sexual violence. In one episode, a damsel appeals to Lancelot by saying, sir, here by this way haunts a knight that distresses all ladies and gentlewomen, and at the least he robbeth them or lieth with by them. Lancelot expresses outrage that this rapist knight would violate his vows in such a fashion. What, said Sir Lancelot, is he a thief and a knight and a ravisher of women? He doth shame unto the order of knighthood and contrary unto his oath. Lancelot attacks the knight and uses his sword to split his neck and throat in half, or his neck and head in half unto the throat. He concludes by asking, now damsel, will ye any more service of me? As Corinne Saunders notes, the protection of women from rape proves the chivalric knight in texts such as these. At the same time, however, Amy and Vine shows how rapes perpetrated by knights are portrayed as central to their chivalric identity, pointing to a number of examples, including the famous unnamed rapist knight from King Arthur's court in Geoffrey Chaucer's Wife of Bass Tale. The doubled rhetoric of knightly service is most chilling and illuminating in a late 15th century poem about a knight who assaults a peasant girl whom he encounters alone in the forest. The knight first deploys the traditional rhetoric of courtly service to a lady, lavishing compliments on her beauty, offering her gifts, calling her damsel, and declaring his desire to win her love. But after the woman continues to reject him, the poem revises its definition of service to include rape. It says, he took her about the middle small or slender waist and laid her down upon the green. Twice or thrice he served her so withal, or completely. I've always been struck by how the text deploys the verb serve to name the knight's rape of the maiden after cataloging all his traditional strategies of chivalric service to women. How the same rhetoric names both knightly obligation to protect women from violation and knight's perpetration of sexual assault. Like medieval knights, the police in our own society undertake a mission to protect vulnerable individuals from sexual violence. 
The Philadelphia Police Department's official directive for its Special Victims Unit states, the primary goal of the department in regard to sexual predators is the protection and safety of the children and citizens of the community. In December 2018, Police Inspector Anthony Washington received a prestigious promotion, giving him oversight of the Special Victims Unit. Washington had a well-documented record of sexual misconduct that included internal complaints by at least four fellow officers, as well as a Temple University student who interviewed him for a school project. Between 2011 and 2014, the city paid $198,000 to victims of Washington's alleged misconduct. Washington was removed from his position of authority over the Special Victims Unit in October of last year, only after the Philadelphia Inquirer published an in-depth investigation of his long record. He is still employed by the city's police department. Police sexual misconduct, in addition to directly contradicting the organization's stated mission to protect and serve individuals threatened by sexual violence, disproportionately victimizes women of color and is inextricably intertwined with police brutality, making it an issue of pressing significance in our present moment. It's important to note that three of the four officers who filed complaints against Washington were black women, illustrating how perpetrators in uniform pr prey on black women, girls, and femmes, both within and outside police departments, as Andrea J. Ritchie notes in her extensive research on police sexual violence against women of color. Tanya Milligan, one of Washington's colleagues who received a monetary settlement after suing him for sexual harassment, stated, we were sworn to protect and serve the public, but no one was there to protect us. Me Too founder and civil rights activist Tarana Burke discussed police sexual violence as a frequently overlooked form of police brutality in a televised interview last month. Illustrating this neglected linkage between police sexual violence and other forms of brutality that are highlighted by the Say Her Name movement, Brett Hankison, the only Louisville police officer who has been fired for the March 2020 murder of Breonna Taylor, although he has not been arrested, is also currently under investigation for sexually assaulting or harassing at least five women. Hankison allegedly targeted women leaving bars at night, offering them rides home in his police cruiser before making inappropriate advances or sexually abusing them. The connections I've briefly sketched out today matter because both medieval knights and contemporary police officers hold positions of great social power and authority, and they are charged with the mission to protect and serve those who are vulnerable. Both are always armed as part of their position, further adding to their relative power. One could argue that medieval fictional knights are in fact sometimes portrayed as more vulnerable to consequences for their predatory behavior than real life police officers although I want to make clear that I do not endorse these particular types of violent consequences. Chaucer's rapist knight is condemned to death by King Arthur, although he is later spared by the queen's mercy. Lancelot splits the head and neck of the rapist knight in the Mort Arthur. Meanwhile, Anthony Washington still works for the Philadelphia Police Department, and Brett Hankison is still a free man. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Cord Whitaker. I also wish to thank uh, the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies and Ayanna Thompson and Leah Newsom, uh, Leah Newsom uh, for this opportunity to present today. Um, I will be sharing a PowerPoint with you. Um, so let me pull that up and then I will launch right in. Uh, uh, apparently, I'm not able to share the screen right now. Yeah, uh, hmm. yeah. The host. I'm t being told the host has disabled screen sharing. There we go. All right. Thank you very much, Leah. All right. So what I'm offering you today is titled To Protect and to Serve, Policing and Chivalric Violence. During the second week of June, 
I was on a Zoom call with a grad student in African American literature and Marxism. Uh, let's call him Karl for Karl Marx. He had been protesting against racial injustice and police brutality on the streets of New York City every night for two weeks. He'd been brutalized by NYPD and held for 72 hours, bound in zip ties for most of it, after he and other protesters were arrested exactly one minute after the citywide curfew. When I shifted my gaze, however, as I was on the Zoom call, when I shifted my gaze from his face to my own, I could very clearly see the 19th century, early 19th century chandelier behind me. When I shifted my gaze forward beyond the screen, I could clearly see the ornate staircase that we now know was crafted by an enslaved black artisan in the early 19th century. You see, I was keeping up with early June's protests from the pastoral environs of an anti-racist educator and activist friend's historic home in Eastern North Carolina, pictured here. From the vantage of this former plantation, I considered the horrors of racism and police brutality, even as I enjoyed the luxury of the big house and the horticultural beauty of the grounds. And I thought of that craftsman who made that staircase. Etched into each and every step is a, a curly cue pattern, not far off from the acanthus that adorns the margins of so many medieval manuscripts. What if that craftsman had tried to escape? Surely his skills would have been far too valuable to simply let him go. And he would have encountered, he would have likely encountered something similar to what Carl had encountered. That is, he would have encountered a slave patrol, the pre-Civil War Southern descendant of modern policing. Now, of course, in the North, municipal police forces grew out of more informal night watch and constable systems. But for the moment, I want to focus on those Southern slave patrols. And slave patrols chased after both known runaway slaves as they also patrolled for newly fugitive and as yet undetected escapees. They checked the papers of blacks found traveling on the road. Uh, they would ask, were they on master's business? Were they legally free? Were they runaways to be captured, disciplined, and returned to their owner? And even if they were on master's business or legally free, there could be some violence involved, just enough to keep the blacks in line. So they would not forget their supposed place in the order of things. As the black Marxist political historian Cedric Robinson has pointed out, the specter of medieval feudalism lurks in the background of the New World's chattel enslavement of Africans. So when Carl was held for 72 hours, he witnessed other protesters who had been more brutalized than he had, people with open gashes um, and who were held for as long as he was with no medical attention. You see, violence was part of the NYPD strategy, but not theirs alone, however. And for my fellow medievalists out here, here's why I'm starting to get to more of the medievalism of things. One of the days that Carl was held was June 1st. So he overheard New York officers discussing events 90 miles to the south. And for context here, I'll add, I am a Philadelphian. I am speaking to you right now from, uh, from South Philly. And a mere eight miles north of my South Philadelphia home, Events were playing out that were making some NYPD members absolutely gleeful. A baseball bat wielding white male mob had assembled to protect Fishtown, a still somewhat hard scrabble uh, but slowly gentrifying neighborhood in the north of the city. They called themselves old time Fishtowners and claimed to protect the neighborhood from Black Lives Matter protesters. And they're picked, some of them are pictured here. Quoting the account of John Ahrens, a WHYY producer who just happened to be on the scene that day, quote, one guy tells a cop, I'm not here to make your job harder. I want to protect you. And then a guy in a Trump hat raised his hand and greeted his friend by saying, white man, end quote. The Philadelphia police did show up, but they did not disperse this crowd. 
and they let the crowd go on shouting obscenities at the BLM protesters they encountered. The police also did not disperse them as they brandished weapons, such as this gentleman with an ax, um, and they brandished these at unarmed protesters. Indeed, they let them carry on for hours this way. Now, thanks to journalist Aaron's reporting, we hear the obscenities hurled, we see the evidence that this mob was not offering peaceful counter protest. And one couple, Matt Williams and Kara Khan, had the misfortune of passing by on their bikes after returning from a BLM protest in which police had tear gassed them. The bat wielding men, including ringleader Richie Goodwin, chased them, knocked Williams down, and beat him mercilessly. And he, that was caught on camera when you see Goodwin beating Williams. The chaos brought glee to these NYPD officers whom my friend, Carl, overheard. Before the end of the night, Aarons himself was assaulted when a group of the bat-wielding men chased him for video recording them. They beat him, broke his nose, and sent him to the ER. This next image is a little gruesome, um, so just a fair warning. You may wish to look away, but Aarons posted this on his uh, social media uh, account on Twitter. Now on Aarons' Twitter thread, there are many comments supporting BLM and expressing concern for Aaron's. But there are also a number of replies that he should have minded his business, that these were good men defending their neighborhood. His tweets and later investigation report that the mob ended the night when rioter Justin Haskell proclaimed, we did our job, we did our job. The violent vigilantism on offer on June 1st has precedence in the slave patrols that provided part of the basis for modern policing. And after all, slave patrols, often by law, conscripted nearly all white men into some amount of service. But such vigilantism also has roots in the racist medievalisms that have attended such nefarious projects as Benito Mussolini's fascism, Mussolini pictured here. Mussolini, however, was influenced by the Italian philosopher Julius Evola, pictured here, who also considered himself a medievalist. Evola, quote, advanced a radical doctrine of anti-egalitarianism, anti-democracy, anti-liberalism, anti-Semitism. He scorned the modern world of popular rule and bourgeois values, democracy and socialism, seeing capitalism and communism as twin aspects of the benighted reign of materialism. He argues for the primacy instead of a spiritual realm in which medieval knighthood is a spiritual identity. Using the Templars as his example, he argues that this chivalric identity should, should be primary over and against, and even in place of, Christianity and the church. Evola's followers, from Mussolini down to Steve Bannon and Richard Spencer, have considered this knighthood nearly hereditary. In the warrior, Evola writes, there was a force similar to a fluid that was capable of creating new knights by direct transmission. And it is the birthright of the descendants of European chivalry. It is the birthright of white men. Such glaringly racist political projects as Mussolini's and with it Hitler's share their raison d'etre with such seemingly innocuous symbolic statements as the defaced US flags that adorn the backs of so many American cars and the fronts of so many U.S. homes. Mostly drained of their, of their colors, these flags sport only one bright spot, a thin blue line. It represents the police, standing between right and wrong, good and bad, the law-abiding citizen and the criminal element. The police, like Evolda's Templars, like even the denizens of the alt-right, are the inheritors of chivalric knighthood. They are as knights errant or wandering, defending the virtuous who deserve to be defended and imbued through their heritage with superlative spiritual power. This image here is the crest, the modern crest of the National Reti Retired Police Officers Organization in the UK. Modern policing gets its violence honestly. It gets its racism honestly too. But reforming it, revolutionizing it, defunding it, or abolishing it would all do well to recognize that modern policing 
also gets its power from an outsized sense of spiritual value, of superlative spiritual worth that attends the medievalism residing at the heart of white identity. It's a complex medievalism to be sure, a notion of primitivism and purity, of violence and chivalry, of brutality and, med <clears throat> and honor that resides at the heart of whiteness. That very complexity enables us to say, but there are black police officers, but the police do many good things, but who do I call when there's a prowler or hashtag not all police? No matter what the evidence shows, no matter even when someone like Arthur Reiser, a former officer and conservative think tank researcher on police cultures, says that racist and violent cultures do permeate the field. Our conversation about what it means to protect and serve today cannot be complete without considering the role of chivalric honor and what horrors chivalry can excuse and even valorize. Back to the house in Eastern North Carolina, it is not entirely the original plantation home. My friend's family has had it only since the 50s. And her father, however, made the mistake of vocally supporting integration. The Ku Klux Klan broke down the gates, attacked the home, and burned it, my, family, my friend's family narrowly escaping. They rebuilt, however. And though it can't be proven, no one would be surprised if some of those Klan member arsonists were also on the town police force, just keeping order and just like the boys in Fishtown, doing their jobs. Thank you. And last but not least, Margo Hendricks. I want to join um, the other voices in thanking Ayana, the center, Leah, and Jeff for um, supporting us in the way that they have over the past couple of years. Um, I'm going to talk about a different kind of policing and serving not the one that takes place in the streets. I'm gonna talk about the one that takes place in the academy. I want to begin with a rec. If you haven't watched uh, Barnard College's Digital Humanities program, Unsilenced Past, do it, it's lit. To Protect and Serve was born circa 1955 for use by the LAPD as a PR campaign. 10 years later, they rolled into Watts to protect and serve. In 1992, LAPD wrote in to protect and serve during an uprising. As we look at the uprisings taking place in 2020, we again, to, we again see the policing apparatus writing in to protect and serve. I'm a Californian, so my references will be California. In my lifetime, I have experienced a variety of incarnations of to protect and serve. Some I won't recount, because they're far too painful memories, despite the passage of time, I have also been protected and served. The current uprisings are a testament to this problematic motto's history. The to protect and serve I want to speak to today is not the one taking place on the streets or in our homes. It's the way to protect and serve operates in pre and early modern studies and affects, I can't say BIPOCs, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to say BIPOC and other marginalized scholarly bi bodies. BIPOCs just sounds like something negative. If you haven't read, it's time to end the Publishing Gateway Manifesto in the Sundial published 61120. Do so as it speaks to one type of protecting and serving in the policing of the academy. My academic moments with this type of policing are not numerous, but they remain part of my psyche. Like most BIPOC researchers, scholars, faculty, these moments come as part of a complex system of academic gatekeeping, including but not exclusive to publications. This system is far more problematic and therefore insidious, insidious when it comes to employment and retention. So hence my concern. This concern is prompted by a Twitter hashtag, Black in the Ivory, if you're not on Twitter. Um, it's, it's an interesting moment. 
As a black academic and a senior Shakespearean, I found the accounts painfully familiar and hard to read. Many of the tweets recounted the anti-black behavior by non-black indigenous POC academics, the peculiar alignment of marginalized people with white cishet academics, and of course, the ubiquitous academic Karens who abandon allyship when their privilege is threatened. This Twitter hashtag, coupled with recent accounts of anti-Blackness performed by senior POCs in my specific field, inform the remainder of my remarks, which are in the form of, a question, of questions. To my senior and star BIPOCs and allied colleagues working in pre and early modern fields, I ask you, how implicated are we in the white supremacists to protect and serve practices in our fields? Practices that have kept the academy primarily cis hat and white. How invested are we in protecting our professional cachet that we have become de facto allies to white supremacy through our anti blackness, anti indigenous, anti brownness, anti Asianness, micro and macro aggressions? Have we truly lost sight of what it means to be marginalized, contained, denigrated? or niched for the work that made our careers? Have we done enough to protect and serve BIPOC, early career researchers, independent scholars, graduate students, and undergraduate students from pernicious attacks or retaliations, not just by white academics, but by our own BIPOC colleagues? Are there better ways to protect and serve the community and other marginalized scholars entering our fields? Have we taken a stand against the protective badge of anonymity, long a tool of academic white supremacy, not just in terms of publications, but in employment decisions, the hiring, the tenuring, and the promotion of our colleagues? Do we recognize that our silence implicates us as well? Shouldn't we begin to recognize not all skin folk are kin folk? That allyship is not about wearing I support Black, Indigenous, and people of color button, but the investment in protecting and serving a new scholar, a new scholar's career, as I was re recently reminded. In the context of this session, two points resonate with me. One, we may not be the first, but we can be the loudest and I try my best, as some of you know. And two, to all my senior Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and marginalized academics. At this stage in our careers, in the end, who are we here to protect and serve, if not the next generation? As I was reminded today, as I watched the Barnard um, Unsilenced Pass uh, webinar, our silence does not go unheard. We need to speak louder. Thanks. Thank you all. Um, I invite the speakers to unmute themselves so that we can start a dialogue. And uh, I think I first want to say thank you for um, being willing to speak at this time when I know that we're all exhausted <laughs> and and maybe i'll just speak for myself but i know justin used that phrase so um it's it's been a minute it's been a rough minute so thank you for your time and your thought and um my god those talks were lit um so here's a question from one of the viewers what kind of resources do we need so that pre and early modern um, scholars of color can carry out their scholarship and teaching to the fullest. And I think uh, this, is a, this is like hitting the nail on the head because um, if Justin is asking what now, I think this is kind of at the heart of what now for um, not only the systems that we're in and our white allies, but also for ourselves. Um, so does anyone have ideas about what kind of resources we'd need to support um, scholars of color in pre-modern fields? I'll jump in. Um, I think, first of all, I want to say that you and the center um, have begun that process. 
you have linked um, people in ways now, especially with the with the virus sweeping and driving us into our homes, unable to make the contact of keeping us together. I think the other issue for me, and it's something that um, I was reminded of at Race Before Race too, that um, as a senior person in the field, I need to not go into my corner. I need to stand behind um, this generation and future generations. I don't teach, but that doesn't mean I can't do. Um, so I'm gonna say I do what I can. The other issue is self-care. Y'all need to protect yourselves, okay? Y'all need to protect yourselves. If you need to take an exile, walk away and come back. That's the only thing I can say. I, um, I wanna add to that. Thank you, Margo and, and Ayana. Um, Something that Cord brought up that I've been thinking about lately uh, as police abolition, um, you know, reading the work of anyone from Angela Davis to Ruth Gilmore to uh, Bettina Love um, and, and thinking about uh, not just prison and police abolition, but what are the ways in which those kinds of concepts, um, what, what can they offer to what we do in academia? Uh, can we reform the academy enough or is there something endemic, is there something inherent that needs to uh, dissolve, right? So one thing I think of immediately, you know, we could talk about um, changing our hiring practices, right? Changing what tenure means at our institutions, um, you know, uh, having different kinds of panels and, and speakers at conferences, uh, changing editorial boards at journals and, and presses. But ultimately, does that, continue to try to fit a square peg into a circle, you know? And, and, and so I wonder what are the things that need to completely be rethought? And I think I agree with Margot that the, the race before race collective is something that does that. Uh, it invites uh, scholars to come and rethink what we do from the ground up, not just recreate the, the, the wheel that's already run flat, so to speak. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think that uh, more, collectives, intellectual collectives, where uh, scholars are invited to be creative and reimagine what we do from the very foundation of what we're trained to do. I think that's uh, critical to, um, to creating those resources that will actually be good mm -hmm. for, for all of us, because uh, when, when it's good for the least of us, it's good for all of us. I want to add a little bit to what Justin just said too. I think it's telling that the that many of the structures um, that facilitate gatekeeping in the academy, uh, a lot of the structures Justin just mentioned, um, are contemporaneous in their origin, uh, not only with the development of our disciplines as as they currently appear in the early to mid 19th centuries. Um, but also, uh, they're, they're also contemporaneous with the origin of municipal policing. Um, the mm -hmm. first known municipal police department uh, appears in London in the late 1820s, uh, then follows on in US cities, sort of building on systems that were already extant of sort of night watches, voluntary night watches and militias, et cetera. But they built on those systems and you see the first municipal police departments coming into American cities in the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s, 1880s. Um, so there are, uh, there's a very particular idea of order and a very 19th century idea of order that pervades both policing and pervades uh, the academy. Um, and of course there are contextual differences, but there is a, to borrow a word from my own talk, there's a kind of spiritual resonance. There is a, a endemic concern with orderliness, yeah. with knowing who belongs. And knowing who belongs almost necessarily uh, it, it necessitates knowing who does not. And that's the structure. That's the, the, 
the kernel that I think we need to investigate um, brutally, to investigate revolutionarily uh, before we can, you know, before any of those other things that Justin just mentioned can be anything but trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. And I just want to kind of follow up on that to identify a couple of things that I think institutions specifically can do to support uh, kind of early career faculty of color. Uh, the first is uh, education for our institutions and our colleagues, tenure and promotion committees regarding inherent bias and in student evaluations. The fact that we're often working uphill. Um, so if we, you know, there are certain biases that, that, are, that research has demonstrated are part of these, and if we get good evaluations, then we have kind of gone above and beyond. The second is also awareness on the part of our institutions regarding the extra service responsibilities uh, that faculty of color fulfill. And not only the quantity, but also the uh, kind of extra emotional weight that, and toll that these service responsibilities take. So those are two things that I would add. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's hitting the nail on the head. I've had um, several long conversations with administrators at, at my lovely supportive institution about the fact that they didn't understand all the invisible labor I was doing. And I had to say, do you understand the work that we're doing behind the scenes is one of the few things that makes the academy run. And if we stop doing it, it yeah. grinds to a halt. Yeah. So. I, I created a little firestorm by talking about academic reparations, but <laughs> we'll see. I think we need to talk about that a little bit more. I think we probably should. <laughs> um, so another question, and I, I think this is um, uh, and also really a really good one. How should we prepare ourselves and our students for what will inevitably be an extremely emotional and potentially dangerous election, especially for Black, Indigenous, people of color, students, and faculty? <laughs> um, my instinctive cool. response is <laughs> on yourselves. Um, and that's just, you know, that revolutionary part of me. Um, honestly, I think, one, we need to talk about this in the classroom, whether it's online or face-to-face. I think we need to heighten our awareness of the need to provide a protective space for not just the grief, but the unexploded anger, the fear that these students are going to walk into the classroom with, especially um, students of color, especially black students, especially indigenous students. They're going to walk in afraid the fear that's running rampant in our streets is going to walk with them into the classrooms. So I think that's where it's going to, it, where it's going to have to take place is you're going to have to be strong enough to help them manage that emotional state that leads up to an election that I honestly don't see um, going off as easy as previous ones. There's going to be a lot of violence and we need to prepare them for that and figure out ways for them to protect what's left of a revolutionary moment because it's too easy to give up. That's my thought. Justin, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you're starting a brand new job. Yeah. Um, have you thought of, I'm sure you've thought about this, but I wonder if you'd be willing to share your thoughts. Uh, absolutely. Um, I'm teaching a course, uh, Shakespeare, advanced Shakespeare course, called um, uh, Shakespeare, Kings, Queens, and Tyrants. And I, I, I designed this course with the election in mind before the pandemic. And uh, I, I think what Margot said is really important, but I would go a step farther and say, you know, that uh, in our classes, for those of us who, who do uh, teach in those spaces, because I, I do want to recognize that many of us are uh, scholars, but who don't teach in the classroom uh, and are contributing to these conversations uh, equally. But uh, for those of us who are in the classroom, I think it's important to center these conversations about what happens outside of the, the four walls of the classroom, to bring that in and make it uh, part and parcel to the class itself. 
in the DNA. Um, so that students don't think that they, you know, this class or the work that we do that we find really important and really interesting um, isn't tangential or ancillary, that these things are intertwined at the very root. Uh, and I think the classroom is an amazing space for, for us to show our students uh, how to think deeply, not only about the literature that we study and the history we study, but about the present day. So I think we have to make uh, the election and, and, and protesting and all sorts of things, we have to make that central to um, the, the DNA of our courses um, for those of us who are in the classroom. I might add to that, um, that for those of us who teach in literature, um, I think it is I, I think it's part of our, our ethical, indeed even moral responsibility to teach about the role of narrative in shaping the world. Um, how we tell the story about what is happening, how we tell the story about what's happening outside the classroom um, is central to what happens next. Um, and it's central to how, you know, to how those occurrences are remembered and shape events far in the future. Um, so I think it's really important that, especially when we're teaching historical literatures, we're always teaching students how to analyze and, and unearth um, the way that those, the, the way that the stories we're studying are encapsulating their own periods, the way that they are interpreting uh, the world around them. And, you know, and, and I think this is, uh, I, I think it's important to do it at everything from the level of, you know, from the level of an overarching plot of, of a narrative, right down to uh, much more, um, to some they might seem minute, minute, to me they seem like everything, but rhetorical choices. Um, you know, the way that, for example, the way that uh, a par parallelism is present in a particular sentence or not, and the you know the emotional or intellectual responses that that may evoke in a reader or not, and then going the next step to well that may evoke this response in you the modern reader, but when we historicize it, might it be evoking a different response in the con in the reader who's contemporary to the text. So I think all of that is, um, you know, is a really powerful skill that those of us who are teaching in literature and other adjacent fields, such as history, um, uh, have. And it's probably beyond a skill. I'd say more it's a superpower. I think that's fa fantastic and absolutely right. Um, okay, we have a question from uh, someone who says, what is your advice to scholars of color who are one of very few representationally in institutions attempting to do anti-racist work. How do they navigate the fine line between doing too much labor and being erased entirely from the process? Um, and I think this sort of goes along with the, some of the questions that Margot was posing at the end of her talk about like how implicated are we in the current structure um, how much work are we willing to do? How much work are we able to do to change some of these institutions? Uh, Carissa, do you want to start us off? Do you have advice? Sure. Yeah, I would say sit down with yourself and think about how you operate, how you are wired, what you feel that you can give, what your gifts are, and what things drain you. And, you know, come to terms with yourself about kind of what you can handle and what you feel is too much. It's going to vary for every person. The kinds of anti-racist work that everyone can do varies according to you know, how they're individually put together and wired. So I would say spend a lot of time accounting with yourself what you feel you can handle and what you feel is too much uh, and know, you know kind of what to take on and what to say no to uh, according to that. And I, I guess I'll, I'll ask everyone, do you feel, so the questioner says there's a fine line between too, doing too much labor and being erased from the process. Is that something that, that um, someone, a scholar of color should, should actually worry about? Margo. <laughs> uh, yes. 
<laughs> I think um, the commitment we make has to, and I agree absolutely with Carissa, you have to know yourself. You have to construct those boundaries about around what you're willing to do, who you can trust. Um, who you can trust is really important. And then also, I, I do want to say, and I offered it, I think many of us do quietly and then publicly, find the individuals who may not be at your institution, but who have engaged in a similar kind of path to help you walk it. You don't have to do it alone. I think that's probably the only, that's the most important advice I can give you. You don't have to walk it alone. Reach out. Don't be afraid to talk to people to find out how they survived it, especially if they're tenured and you're not. If they're promoted and you're going out for promotion, there are places where they can help, even in institutions that want to engage in anti-racist practices, that want to do it. Hiring is going to be an important one, but tenuring is the other. That's all I can say. I think we've actually come to the end of our hour, shockingly, and I wanted to end with a, a little anecdote. Um, only six months ago, I wrote to a, a university press saying, I think you should do a book series on pre-modern critical race studies. And the editor is a lovely person that I've worked with before in the past said, you know, it's really a niche field. I don't think there's enough interest for more than one book series and you've already got one with the University of Pennsylvania Press. And don't you know, this moment, the pandemic, the uprisings, everything that we're experiencing proves that this is not a niche field. Wake up Academy, we're here. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Margot Hendricks, Carissa Harris, Justin Shaw, Cord Whitaker. Thank you, participants who we can't see. Um, reach out to us. We are a network. We're a community. We will protect and serve you.